All right, guys, so we're going to talk about membranes and transport. And as some of you guys who did the cell membrane understand, there's a lot of things on that cell membrane. It is fluid, and that's why they uh, relate it to a mosaic. So this is called the fluid mosaic model. Okay, because a mosaic has what? It has many different glass pieces. If you've ever been to a church or a cathedral or something like that and you've seen mosaics, they have many different pieces of glass and that's why they relate the cell membrane to the fluid mosaic model. We have transport proteins, okay, so channels where things go into and out of. We also have markers, okay, so these things here are carbohydrates extending from that surface protein, and this helps identify friend from foe. Very important in blood transfusion is all, as well. So we have a, a bilayered membrane here as well, and what we have is phospholipids. So we have polar heads, nonpolar tails, polar heads. That means that this area right here likes to interact with water. This area here also likes to interact with water, but this area here does not, okay? Um, and so things have to, things that are too large or have a charge have to pass through the membrane, either through the channels or they can simply diffuse. Look at oxygen. Oxygen is small enough to just go right through the membrane, so it does not need special transport at all. Okay, guys, we talked about this previously, about the structure, when we went over uh, fats, proteins, carbohydrates, and nucleic acids uh, because we know that the cell membrane is made up of two layers. That's why it's called a bilayer. And it's a phospholipid bilayer because of the construction, as I just mentioned to you on the previous the introductory slide, of how the structures are. So you have the polar head, which is circular. It contains phosphate. We know phosphate is one of the elements on the periodic table. And then we have a fatty acid tail. It's nonpolar. So again, one aspect of it wants to interact with water. The other aspect does not like interacting with water. And this structure kind of makes our cell membranes very fluid and motile. Okay, it's not rigid. It's not uh, set in place. Okay, continuing on with the structure of this phospholipid. Everything within that lipid bilayer has a role. As I explained to you before, we have cell surface proteins, and some of those proteins are allowing things to come into and out of that are needed. Others are for identification. In the case of maybe uh, identifying friend from foe, like you know bacteria, viruses, things like that that don't need to come enter into the cell. And also for horm hormones, hormones also have to attach themselves to get into to send their message inside the cell as well. So again, hydrophilic means that it is water loving. It enjoys interacting with water. And hydrophobic means that it does not enjoy interacting with water. All right, I kind of alluded to this when we first were introduced to the lectures, but that is kind of like a mosaic, okay? So you see many different pieces of glass or rock or whatever that is. We commonly see them in synagogues, churches, cathedrals, that kind of stuff. And so the analogy can be made also to the cell membrane because there are many different aspects of the cell membrane, different pieces, different shapes, different protein types, carbohydrates, etc. And that's why you make the analogy or the connection between a real mosaic and what the cell, the fluid mosaic model of the cell membrane. Because there were various membrane uh, creations throughout time, as there is with everything else. This is just the one that's most commonly accepted now. As we see, everything in the cell and in the cell membrane has roles. Okay, so identification markers. I explained that to you. Not only is it for identifying blood type with, with transfusions and things like that, but it, it can also for friend and foe. Transport proteins, things coming into and out of the cell. Enzymes. We know that enzymes do what? They catalyze reactions. They reduce the amount of time that uh, uh, 
things have to occur inside of the cells, and also fibers attached to the cytoskeleton. So all of these different things, proteins, as we know, are very important. Okay, they're one of the four major macromolecules that occur, but also um, they make up the cell membrane and play a very essential role there as well. Okay, this slide just gives us some more information about uh, other roles of the cell membrane proteins. You guys can take a picture if you like and add it into your notes. Uh, but we need to differentiate between what's happening here. So the light blue represents outside of the cell. The yellow represents inside of the cell. And these things are going to function in different, in different situations, okay? Sometimes things that go against the grain in life require energy, effort, etc. So, active transport, which we're going to differentiate, active transport, which we see here in one of these uh, illustrations, we also see passive transport, we see cell communication here, okay? We see the identification markers, we see how enzymes work with. Uh, substrate, active site, and enzyme. So all of the different functions of a protein in the cell and the cell membrane are illustrated in, in these pictures here. Okay, a few of you, when we were doing our projects, you differentiated between cell walls and cell membranes. You also explained to us when you did your projects the difference between these things. We know that plants, bacteria, and fungi, and in certain protists, have cell walls, all right? We also know that the function is for support and protection, but it does not restrict things coming into and out of. And the cell walls are made up of what? Cellulose in most cases, but they could be composed of other structural components that we find in our cells. All right, so one of our main things that is going to get accomplished from this lecture and from this information is understanding why and how things move into and out of the cell membrane. And things move based on water moves, based on how much water is present on either side of the membrane, but also how much other substances like solutes are present. So we have to go back into discussing uh, our differentiation between solvents and solutes and solutions. Okay, so. Water is going to move in an area in a direction where there's more solute because if there's more solute then that means that there's less water present. Okay, so water crosses against membranes based on how much water is present on either side of the membrane and also how much solute is present. So if we look at the statement here, it says concentration equals solute divided by solvent. The more solute that you have compared to solvent, the more concentrated the solution is. So again, the more substance you have, the more salt you have in a solution, the more concentrated that solution is. So it makes sense that a 5% salt solution is more concentrated than a 2% salt solution. All right, so diffusion, pretty simple process. Uh, going from a lot of something to where there's less of something. So on this illustration, we have all of these green molecules. They're going to go by diffusion. There's a greater concentration here on the left side of the, of the arrows than there are on the right side. So these molecules are naturally going to go from where there's more to where there's less. This does not require energy. It is a natural process. It is free as far as energy goes because you're going with the flow. You're not going against the grain. The biggest misconception with equilibrium is that things stop moving and things stop working basically. No, it takes just as much going in and out to maintain equilibrium. So things are still moving in and out. Stuff is not stagnant, it doesn't stay still. Equilibrium does not mean that things are not happening. It means that the same amount going in is the same amount coming out at the same time. All right, yesterday we left off at equilibrium. And remember, equilibrium means that there's just an even amount of things coming in as coming out, as is illustrated by this <coughs> graphic here. Okay, so 
We have the time going across. How much time does it take? See our lipid bilayer with our cell membrane, and we see particles starting off on one side versus on the other side. And in the end there, we see them at equilibrium. Same amount on either side of the membrane. Now again, that doesn't mean that things are not happening. Work has to be done to maintain equilibrium, and that's very important to... Okay, selectively permeable means that only it's exclusive. Okay, only certain things can get in. Just like when you get older and you start going to clubs, only certain people, certain dress, whatever it is, get VIP status, okay? So same thing, very selective. Membranes are very selective. You, everybody does not get into the VIP room, all right? Uh, they only let certain things in. So, and we know that we differentiate osmosis is very important. It is not different from diffusion. It is a type of diffusion. That is very important to understand, but it only happens with water molecules because water is polar. It is also relatively small compared to some other things and it doesn't have a charge. Therefore, it can pass right through with no energy and easily. Things that have a charge though and nonpolar molecules have a hard time getting through the cell membrane. So they have to have special passageways. All right, so we have to differentiate between the types of solutions, okay? We have hypertonic, which means that it's more concentrated. So that means that in this instance, in a hypertonic solution, water is going to move out of. And if it's a cell, it will shrink in this case, okay? Now, we're talking about whether if we have a cell in uh, like a beaker and maybe some water surrounding those cells. Hypotonic solutions are less concentrated. So there's not a lot of water in that instance and water will flood right into the cell membrane and cause that cell to swell. Isotonic solution, nothing will happen because water molecule in, water molecule out, it's even, okay? So water again, water again is going to always move where there is less water, but more of something else. Okay, so if you have a solution, you have maybe water and salt in there, okay, and it's inside of a membrane. Well, water is going to cross into that membrane and go where there's more concentrated solution of solute versus where there's water. Okay, now the pressure that happens with this is called osmotic pressure. That's the registration of pressure for osmosis. All right, so again, we have a differentiation. The dashed line represents the membrane. We have concentrated sugar solution and water on one side. We have dilute sugar solution and a couple molecules of sugar on the other side. Which way will water go? Which direction will the water molecules go? They're going to go left. Why? Right, there's more concentrated sugar molecules on the left and less water molecules, so water's going to go to the left. To the left, to the left. Okay, so what will happen to the water levels on the right? The water levels on the right are probably going to lower a little bit, and the water levels on the left are probably going to rise. All right, guys, so here we go. It says, look at these structures. Identify the hypertonic and hypotonic sides. The hypertonic is within the cell, okay? There are more particles in there that makes that hypertonic, okay? So on the outside then would be hypotonic. Now, water is going to go into the cell, right? So water is going to go into the cell. What's going to happen to that cell? It's going to swell up. And if it's a animal cell, guess what? If it swells up too much, it will burst. Okay, if, it's, if it is a plant cell, the cell wall enjoys being that swollen uh, turgid filling and so nothing will happen. Okay, now when you gargle salt water, how many people's grandma or parents or whatever say, hey, you got a sore throat, gargle salt water, okay? Well, what that happens, what happens with that is that it causes the, the bacteria cells to basically lose water. Okay, water is fleeing out of the bacteria cells, going into your, the mouth as the salt is there because you have salt, salty water versus the pure water in the cells and it's gonna come, come right on out. 
Okay, so that's one of the things that happens. Also, if you were, um, if you ever lived in a colder climate and you had ice on the sidewalk and they put salt out there to get rid of the, the ice, some of you don't know what I'm talking about, some of you do, but anyway, you notice how on, next to the grass, when it happens, the plants kind of die and wilter? Well, that's what's happening. That salt draws the water out of the plants. Constantly trying to move into cells, constantly trying to move out of cells, and it says, how do they cope with that? Well, they have various structures that allow them to do that. Just like I used the analogy earlier, a contractual vacuole is like a pump on a boat. Water comes into the boat, you better have something to help you get that water out or else the boat's going to sink eventually because water is going to go inside of there. Organisms like us, we have a homeostatic balance that helps us control okay, our blood concentrations and hormonal levels and stuff like that. So we have internal controls that we don't have to deal with. Plants, they use their vacuoles to deal with this issue. Because again, guys, water is always trying to move. Is trying to go into or leave out of the cells based on what's happening within him. Okay, in our picture here, we just have some different types of cells. Uh, red blood cells and how they deal with it. Red blood cell is an animal cell. So too much water going in is not good for any animal cell. It may burst or explode. Okay, now, you got thousands of different cells depending on what kind of cells burst and all that kind of stuff, where they're located you know, whether it's causing a tumor, all that stuff, one cell bursting and being damaged may not be an adverse situation. Plant cells, as we know, plant cells have cell walls that help prevent them from losing too much. It helps regulate it and actually, you know that bloated feeling you feel when you're full? Plants like being bloated. They like that feeling. They don't like the other way around where they're losing water and their, their cells stand to the cell membrane pulls away from the cell wall, shrinks up. That's not a good feeling for a plant. And ultimately it can wilt and die if it doesn't get water soon. So here's why this is here. Because penicillin, what it does is it helps swell up. It causes those, those pathogens to swell, their cells to swell, and it bursts them. Okay, so the substance within it helps water flow into the bacteria cell and it will cause that cell to burst and explode. Now there are also some chemical mechanisms that help that happen, but that's, you know, just on the basic level, what happens when you add penicillin that's designed to counteract and kill uh, bacterial um, pathogens. All right guys, uh, facilitation means to assist. So my job as a teacher is to facilitate the learning process it, for you. Okay, is to guide you where you need to find the information. It's not always to tell you where to find the information, it's to clarify, assist, and to guide and facilitate the learning experience. So, things that can't cross the cell membrane might have to be assisted in. Okay, and that's what facilitated diffusion is. Facilitated diffusion is free, doesn't require any cellular energy. Okay, so it says facilitate the transport, it assists in the transport. You are moving from high to low still. Hundreds of channels, those little channel ways into the cell membrane, okay? An example of something that gets in there is glucose. Glucose goes in through a channel protein. Okay, we have an illustration that shows us the example. We have molecules on the outside that desire to get into the cell. And notice how those molecules are specifically shaped doesn't mean that a other type of molecule is going to get in, okay? That square shaped molecule goes right in through that channel. So channels just don't let anything in, okay? They just don't let anything in. You still have to have proper access to go in. Okay, now, the difference between active transport and facilitated diffusion is that active transport requires cellular energy. You know why? Because it goes against the grain. It's kind of like the person, when you guys are leaving this classroom, that tries to force their way into the classroom. That takes excess energy, time, bumping into people, etc. Okay, because they're going against the, the grain. Or, 
when you guys, your mom and dad, tell you to do something, you decide to do something else, then guess what? There's probably a consequence for it because you're going against the grain. You're rebelling. You're doing something that requires energy. In this instance, it's not going from higher to lower necessarily. It's going from where it's needed. It's going to where it's needed. So that requires cellular energy. It is going from lower to higher in some instances. That is not the natural flow of things, but it is important process and it has to happen. Okay, so you can be as different as you want to be, and that's great in a lot of, lot of respects as we relate it to being human beings and people, but sometimes being unique, which is beneficial in a lot of instances, it <coughs> requires extra energy, extra money, extra whatever it is, okay? And there could be some benefits to it, but it's not as easy as going with the flow and doing the natural normal thing which, hey, you might not benefit a lot in life from doing that too, you gotta take some risks, okay? So again, back to what we're talking about, things getting across the concentration gradient. Concentration gradient is how much of a substance is on either side of the membrane. How many students of Mr. Morgan's is currently on the inside of this room versus in the hallway right there, okay? So the concentration gradient is the difference in the amount of students the barrier would be the door, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so some things, nerve cells work this way. They have to pump molecules in. Sodium and potassium have to go in. Uh, other muscle cells work this way. So, again, certain things pass through the membrane without energy. Other things require cellular energy. And active transport um, is defined by requiring cellular energy for molecules to come in. The main type of energy used by the cell is defined as adenosine triphosphate, or its nickname ATP. ATP is the energy currency of the cell. Okay, how do you get it? You have to invest something into this to get it out. Okay, you have to invest food or glucose. You invest glucose, you get energy, you get ATP. ATP is what fuels these cellular processes. ATP is what helps those molecules cross the membrane going against the concentration gradient. Okay, this is a sodium potassium pump. I kind of explained this to you already. In this instance, when two potassium come in, which are the green molecules at the top, three sodium have to come out. Okay, that is the ratio. You guys learned about that on the coloring worksheet yesterday. All right, other things that require cellular energy, and this deals with vacuoles forming from membranes, which you guys probably were introduced to, or we were introduced to it, but you really didn't conceptualize or have a good understanding of it until right now. Endocytosis, endo means coming into, so a vacuole will surround something that has to come into the cell that is unable to get in through diffusion or through regular active transport. So the cell membrane engulfs it, brings it in through a vacuole, it goes to where it needs to go. Exocytosis, you guys have seen this before too, because we know that Golgi's package things and then they take vacuoles and they ship those things out. Well, this is how they do it. And then waste products and other materials have to be exited out of the cell as well. So vacuoles form, takes it to the cell membrane, that vacuole infuses with the cell membrane and it kind of spits out whatever needs to go out. All right, guys, one of the main things we have to do for section uh, four is differentiate between single-celled and multi-celled organisms. The only single-celled or the primary single-celled organisms that we interact with are bacteria. So, and then there are protists. Protists are things like amoebas, uh, algae, plankton, okay, zooplankton. Those are, those are examples of protists. And they are single cell, they can be animal or they can be plant-like. The, di the difference between a single cell and a multi-celled organism though is that single celled organisms don't have to depend on anything. Multi-celled organisms and their cells have to depend on one another to function properly. For example, the Golgi apparatus or Golgi body has to depend on the ER uh, and the ER has to depend on vacuoles and vesicles and stuff like that. Well, that makes us unique. That makes eukaryotic organisms unique. And as you see there, it says uh, division of labor. What that means is that each organelle has a specific job to do 
and it can carry out its specific job, but that is it is a necessity in eukaryotic organisms. Single cell organisms, unicellular organisms, they don't have to depend on anything else, okay? They don't have many organelles functioning inside of them, so that they're able to carry out and maintain their homeostasis separate from other things. Eukaryotic organisms, homeostasis is maintained because everything has a job to do and the muscle cells, the blood cells, the skin cells, etc., all have organelles within them that help their cells function. And then those cells work together to help the total organism do its job. So we know from previous uh, lessons that cells become tissues, tissues become organs, organs become organ systems, then we have organisms, then we have populations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, higher up until we get to the biosphere, you know, which, which is what Earth is contained in. Again, this points out to the complexity <coughs> and the benefit of being a multi-celled organism because all of these things work in conjunction with one another to make the organism uh, prosper and benefit. So examples of what we have here is that four main types of tissues. Muscular tissue is what's going to comprise all of our muscle cells, allow our muscles to uh, contract and move our, our bodies. Epithelial, uh, that's all of the various types of skin tissue. And then uh, it also lines cavities and surfaces within our bodies. Nervous tissue helps carry nerve impulses, which is going to be the messages sent from our brain to our muscles to help us move. And then we have connective tissue, tissue that is found in between our bones and our ligaments and cartilage. Okay, so uh, spaces in between the cells. So again, these are the four main types, muscular, epithelial, nervous, and connective tissues. But you're only going to find these in a eukaryotic organism like ourselves. Picture that you can capture uh, the four types of tissue and what they look like uh, from an artist's perspective. Connective tissue there in the upper left hand corner. We have our skin tissue or epithelial, muscle tissue, and we have our nervous tissue. Tissue. You can see the, the, the nerve cells, the, the dendrites and the axons coming off of it, which are uh, parts of the nerve cell.